Hi, I'm Benedict and in this video I want to give you an overview on our work on the scaling behavior of public key encryption. And this is joint work with Federico Giacon and Eike Kills. Let's begin with a rough overview. I will first give an introduction into multi-instance security and talk about why I think it is an interesting topic to think about and also discuss in greater detail how we model it. Then I will move to our results on the scaling behavior of hashed Elgamal key encapsulation and finally discuss the results, the technical results which are at core of this, that is new generic group lower bounds on the hardness of solving multiple instances of certain CDH type problems. So let's start with multi-instance security. Typically in cryptography, when we model security of a scheme, we require that it should not be possible for an adversary to break even a single instance or to compromise a single user of that scheme. We sometimes also look at a bit more general definition that is multi-user security. So in this case, it should not be possible to compromise again a single user out of multiple possible targets. Now in this work, we look at a bit different definition that is multi-instance security. So here an attack is only considered to be successful if an adversary is able to compromise all out of n users of a scheme. And what we are interested in, in particular, is the question how much harder performing such a multi-instance attack is than compromising a single user. We could visualize this as follows. So on the x-axis of this graph, we have the number of compromised users, and on the y-axis, we have the computational effort or the running time required to perform an attack on, on the amount of users. Now let's assume that compromising one user requires effort t. Then in the best case, compromising one user does not help at all with compromising the next user. So in this case, compromising n users would take n times the effort and we would have this nice linear scaling behavior. However, it could also be that by breaking one instance of the scheme, we somehow manage to, to find some information which now enables us to, come to break additional instances of the scheme with basically no effort at all. So in this case, we would have this constant scaling behavior. And what we are interested in in our work is the question, what is the actual scaling behavior of a scheme? At first glance, this might sound a bit uh, surprising to you. Because, of course, in theory, we would assume that the parameters of our scheme are chosen in a way such that even breaking a single instance of the scheme is not possible. And then, of course, in particular, it's, it's impossible to break several instances of the scheme. However, unfortunately, in practice, it's quite common that schemes are used with outdated parameters. And now, in that case, it might actually be possible for adversaries with nation-state capabilities to compromise single instances of the scheme and now the scaling behavior of the scheme actually might make the difference between single users being compromised or full-blown mass surveillance and this is actually not only a theoretical uh, concern but this is something which has been exploited uh, in the well-known logjam attack by Adrian et al. So this is an attack on TLS uh, implemented with uh, outdated parameters. So concretely, uh, subgroups of finite fields with prime length uh, 512 bits. And here the authors were able to perform some massive pre-processing, which was only dependent on the used group. And then afterwards, attacking particular instances of the scheme could be done with comparatively little effort. Concretely, breaking 1 million instances of the scheme only took twice the effort of breaking a single instance. So in this case, um, in, in the picture from before, this logjam attack would be very close to this worst case scenario of a constant scaling factor. So in this work, we aim to make this phenomenon of scaling behavior measurable from a theoretical perspective. And to this end, we adapt multi-instance security to the schemes we consider, that is key encapsulation mechanisms, and define the scaling factor of schemes, which measures this scaling behavior. And when then we turn to a concrete scheme, that is hashed Elgamal key encapsulation, 
you consider it for different parameter settings which turn out to have an influence on the scaling behavior and are able to compute the scaling factor in some idealized models, concretely the random oracle and generic group model. And I will talk now in more detail about the first point, that is how do we model multi-instance security and define the scaling factor. To this end, I will give a short reminder on the scheme we look at, that is key encapsulation mechanisms. A chem consists of four algorithms. First, the parameter generation algorithm, which is used to set up global parameters of the scheme, and those parameters are supposed to be used by all users of the scheme. But, uh, individual users then can use a key generation algorithm to set up key pairs consisting of the public and secret key of the scheme and can use the encapsulation algorithm which on input of the parameters and a public key outputs a pair consisting of the so-called encapsulated key k and a ciphertext which is an encryption of this encapsulated key. The intuition being that we want to use this key k as the encryption and decryption key of a symmetric encryption scheme. And finally, we have a decryption algorithm which can be used to recover encapsulated keys from ciphertext when given access to the secret key. I will now explain how we define multi-instance security and to this end actually I will start with a brief reminder on the typical single instance security game for key encapsulation mechanisms. So the intuition behind this game is that the encapsulated keys K should look random for adversaries which only have access to the ciphertext and the public key but not the secret key. And this is captured by the following game. So in the game we set up a challenge bit B, then generate a set of parameters as well as a key pair consisting of the public and the secret key. And then we set up a challenge for the adversary, that is we run the encapsulation algorithm to set up a pair consisting of a ciphertext and corresponding encapsulated key. And if our challenge bit B is zero, we would replace this key with a uniformly random one. Now the adversary gets as input the parameters, the public key, the encapsulated key and the ciphertext, and is supposed to figure out whether this challenge bit was zero or one. And additionally, it also has access to a decryption oracle, which on input of a ciphertext returns a decryption with respect to the generated secret key. And of course, we require that the adversary must not use this de uh, decryption uh, oracle on the challenge. And the advantage of the adversary is simply how much better it does than simply guessing. So how do we modify this game to now capture multi-instance security, where, as a reminder, the adversary is supposed to only win the game if it is able to break all out of n instances of the scheme. So I marked the changes in green. So as you can see now, we no longer generate a single challenge bit, but instead we generate a vector consisting of n challenge bits. Again, only one set of global parameters is set up. And now we essentially generate one challenge for every user with respect to challenge bit bi. That is, we for each of the end users, we generate a pair consistent of the secret key and public key, and then set up this challenge consisting of a ciphertext and encapsulated key, where this encapsulated key is replaced with something uniformly random if challenge bit bi is zero. So the adversary gets as input the parameters and the vectors of public keys encapsulated keys and ciphertexts and again has access to a decryption oracle which it can use now for every uh, of those end users and again we require that it should not use the decryption with respect to user i on the ith challenge. Its output is again only one bit and the adversary wins if it is able to um, correctly guess the exclusive OR over all those N challenge bits. So this multi-instance security notion is an adaption of uh, the XOR notion introduced by Bellari, Ristenpart and Tesaro. And the intuition behind it is that as long as one of those challenge bits looks uniformly random to the adversary, so will the exclusive OR. 
This means in order to win with a noticeable advantage in this game, it actually has to compute or to do break all instances of the scheme. You now might be surprised that we do not use a different security notion where the adversary simply has to compute all n challenge bits. But actually, this was already considered in uh, the paper by Bellari Ristenpart and Tessau. And it turns out that this actually does not capture multi instance security because there exist generic attacks which are able to achieve a high advantage in those games without actually breaking all n instances of the scheme. Okay, so this is multi instance security, how we define it in the paper. And Actually, we look at a bit more general setting in the paper where the adversary has to break m out of n instances of the scheme. So as I said before, in this work we're interested in measuring the scaling behavior of the scheme. So in the question how much harder it is to break n instances of the scheme compared to breaking one instance of the scheme. And to this end we define the scaling factor which is defined as the running time of the fastest adversary, which is able to break n instances of the scheme, divided by the running time of the fastest adversary, breaking one instance of the scheme. And for this talk, I will require this, those adversaries to succeed with success probability one, but in the paper, we actually give a generalized version of this definition. And Using uh, the security definition from before, we are actually able to confirm the intuition from uh, the illustration I had in the beginning of this video, that is, the scaling factor does indeed lie between 1 and n. And now we try to answer the question whether we are able to determine the scaling factor for concrete schemes, and we consider the hashed al gamal scheme. And I'm going to talk about our results on, on the scaling behavior of hashed Algamal key encapsulation in more detail now. So we'll now give a brief overview on our results of, of the scaling behavior of hashed Algamal key encapsulation. We rely on some idealized models, which, as we will see in a minute, is unfortunately uh, necessary. Concretely, we use the random oracle model, which is standard for security proofs of hashed Algamal key encapsulation. And additionally, we model the used groups as generic groups, which is assumed to be meaningful for elliptic curves, elliptic curve groups. As you can see, we consider the scheme for three different parameter settings, which we also call granularity. And they essentially differ in how much information of the used group is shared in between users of the scheme. So the first setting is we call high granularity and it corresponds to how hashed Algamal is typically used in practice. That is, all users rely on a one standardized group with a fixed group generator. In this case, the user's key pairs consist of uh, a group element and the corresponding secret key would be the discrete logarithm with respect to the one group generator. And as you can see, in this case, the scheme does not scale optimally, but also not horribly. So it has a scaling factor of square root of n, which means that in order to break n instances of the scheme, you have to put in square root of n times the effort. The second parameter setting we look at is medium granularity. So in this case, the users still rely on one group, but now every user uses his own group generator, which is part of the secret and public keys. And as you can see, switching to this medium, less efficient medium granularity version does not help in improving the scaling factor, which is again square root of n. And finally, we also look at the low granularity setting. So in this case, there are no parameters at all, but instead every user uses his own group, which we model as independent generic groups. And as you can see, in this case, actually the scheme scales optimally with a scaling factor of n. However, I should remark that this does not seem to be too practical as now every user would have to generate his own group as part of, of the key generation, which is requires quite some effort and also introduces new attack possibilities. So how do we come up with those results? 
um, we try to compute the scanning factor of hashtag ML. That is the time required to break n instances compared to the effort required to break one instance. So let's first look at um, the upper bound, which is actually there's not too much to do because there are known generic algorithms which are able to break several instances of the scheme. So those are uh, variants of, for example, of the baby step giant step algorithm. This allows us to bound the time required to break n instances and also there are known generic group lower bounds on breaking one instance of hashtag amal which gives us um, the desired results. Probably more interesting is the lower bound. So in this case again we can bound the time required to break a single instance of the scheme from above by simply using known generic algorithms as for example baby step giant step and so the technical or the most technical contribution of this work is probably the introduction of, of new generic group lower bounds on the hardness of breaking several instances of hashtag amal in the security definition we, uh, you've just seen. And I will now give you a very high level overview on how we achieve this. So in our first step, we show that uh, breaking n instances of hashtag amal in the random oracle model is at least as hard as breaking n instances of the gap um, uh, of the gap CDH gap computational Diffie Hellman problem, and this is a fairly easy adaption of the standard single instance random oracle model proof of hashtag gamma. And then in a second step, we use the algebraic group model by uh, Fuchsbauer, Kills, and Loss to show that breaking n instances of um, the gap CDH problem is at least as hard as breaking n instances of the gap discrete logarithm problem. So more precisely we show that every generic group lower bound for the gap discrete logarithm problem carries over to the gap CDH problem. And then finally in the last step we derive new generic group lower bounds on the hardness of computing n instances of the gap discrete logarithm problem. So as you have just seen, at core of our results for hashtag Amal are new generic group lower bounds on the hardness of, of solving several instances of CDH type problems and I want to spend the rest of this video to talk about those results in greater detail. So let's begin with definitions of, of those problems. The first one is the multi-instance discrete logarithm problem, which is pretty much what it sounds like. That is, we um, set up n, in, uh, n group elements uniformly at random, and then the adversary on input of those group elements has to recover all discrete logarithms. So what I have here on the slides is the high granularity version where all of those Challenges are defined with respect to a single group and group generator, but this can easily be adapted to medium and low granularity as well. Now the second problem is the multi-instance gap discrete logarithm problem, where the adversary again gets n delog challenges and has to solve them all. The difference being here that additionally it has access to a DDH, so a decisional Diffie-Hellman oracle. That is on input of three group elements x, y, and z. This oracle answers with one if those three group elements form a Diffie-Hellman tuple with respect to the group generator or with zero otherwise. Finally, the third interesting problem for this work is the multi-instance gap CDH problem. Again, the adversary has access to a DDH oracle, but now it gets its input and CDH challenges, that is group elements g to the xi, g to the yi, and it has to solve them all. So it has to compute all g to the xy times yi. And I will now give an overview on our, res our bounds for those problems. There were already some bounds, some generic group bounds known for those problems, concretely for the multi-instance discrete logarithm problem. Concretely, there is a work by Aram Yoon, which gives a bound of square root of n, p, uh, square root of n times p um, steps in order to solve n instances of uh, 
Delox in the high granularity case, as well as a work by uh, Garay et al, which proved the same bound in the low granularity setting. However, unfortunately, we do not know how to prove the hashed Elgamal scheme, which we are interested in in this work, secure, based only on the D-log problem. So um, in this work, we compute several new generic group lower bounds. So in our first, we show that in the high and medium granularity case, actually the bound um, carries uh, over to the multi-instance gap discrete logarithm as well as the multi-instance gap CDH problem. And furthermore, we are able to actually improve the known bound for the multi-instance D-log problem in the low granularity setting by showing that um, both gap D-log and gap CDH actually in order to break n instances require in the generic group model n times square root of p steps. And uh, I should mention that all of those bounds are optimal as there exist corresponding generic um, algorithms. And I now want to spend the rest of the talk to give a very rough intuition on how we um, compute those bounds. Ah, I actually forgot something. We, we also consider a generalization of the D-log problem which we call the um, polycheck D-log problem of degree D. So here the adversary has access to a more general decisional oracle. So you could see the DDH oracle in the gap uh, problems as basically an oracle which evaluates a certain equation of uh, degree 2 in the exponent. And now in this polycheck D-log problem we give the adversary access to an oracle which it can use to compute arbitrary polynomial equations up to degree d uh, in the exponent. And it turns out that in this case the bound decays with a uh, with square root of d. So how do we derive those lower bounds? I will first give some intuition on the gap discrete logarithm problem for high granularity. So we take a similar approach to uh, the work by Aram Yun. That is, we reduce the gap D log problem in the generic group model to a geometric search problem, the so called search by hypersurface problem of degree 2. So, in this problem, we have a space uh, Zp to the n where n corresponds to the, uh, the, is the dimension of the space and corresponds to the number of instances. So in, in this example I drew here, it's, it's two. And the goal of an adversary is to compute a, to, to find a point x, which has been sampled uniformly at random in this space. And to do so, it can ask so-called hypersurface queries, that it is, it can specify hypersurfaces up to degree two. And then as response, the answer is going to be one, marked in green, if the point lies on hypersurface and zero, if this is not the case. So in this example, for example, now the adversary would ask for this circle. X is not on this circle, so the answer would be no. And now maybe with this ellipsoid, um, X actually lies here. So the adversary would now know that X is one of those four points. Okay, so this gives you some intuition on the problem. And it turns out that a reduction playing this search by hypersurface problem can actually be used to perfectly simulate um, the multi-instance gap discrete logarithm problem in the generic group model. And this means in order to, to derive a generic group lower bound on, on gap D log, it's actually enough to find a information theoretic bound for this search by hypersurface problem. So overall, this is quite similar to Yun's approach. However, due to the higher degree we have in this case, um, we actually have to work with commutative algebra compared to uh, linear algebra, which adds uh, some technical challenges. The bounds for low and medium granularity um, are simply derived from the high granularity result. Concretely, for the medium granularity case, we derive it from the n instance uh, bound and for low granularity from the one instance bound. Finally, how do we carry over this bound to the gap computational Diffie-Hellman problem? 
Again, I will first discuss the high granularity case where we have a single group and a single generator. So here we rely on the algebraic group model by Fuchs, Bauer, Kills, and Loss. And we give a reduction that shows that any generic uh, solver of n instances of gaps CDH can actually be transformed into a generic multi-instance gap D log solver. Which means that uh, yeah, solving gap CDH is at least as hard as solving gap D log. And on a very high level, the algebraic group model tells us that without loss of generality, we may assume that our reduction has access to certain information that we are able to exploit in order to extract those D log solutions from solutions to the CDH problem. And then similar to the D log case, the bounds for low and medium granularity are derived from the high granularity bound. So to conclude this video, I will now give a short summary. So we define in this work the scaling factor of schemes, which measures the scaling of a scheme security. That is how much harder it is to break n instances of the scheme compared to breaking one. And we then proceed to compute uh, the scaling factor for variants of the hashtag Gamal key encapsulation mechanism in the generic group model. And to this end, we prove several new generic group lower bounds on the hardness of solving several instances of, of different CDH type problems. Maybe some interesting future directions. So in this work, we look at CAMs, but it might also be interesting to um, see whether in this multi-instance security setting it's possible to come up with more complicated reductions. So for example, consider the CAMDEM paradigm used to, gener uh, to construct public key encryption from a CAM and a DEM. And as a second point, um, it might be interesting to see whether we can also get results when we consider adversaries which uh, perform pre-processing, as there have been some new results on uh, generic group lower bounds with pre-processing. So thank you for your attention. And goodbye.